Welcome to Live Players, where political scientists and strategists Sam Oberia and I discuss the key individuals with the power to alter our current society. Every week, we provide analysis of the news and case studies of live players, as well as key institutions and technologies that make up the global power landscape. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, up ahead, Samo and I do a deep dive on Japan's socio-political structure, geopolitics, and economic future. We recorded this episode just before an earthquake hit Western Japan on January 1st. At the time of publish, the tsunami warnings have been lifted and Japanese officials are assessing the damage. Our conversation goes into how Japan is governed and responds to challenges. Everyone ends up talking about U.S. versus China, and we're going to do uh, some deep dives on, on China as well. But it feels like uh, Japan is kind of an underrated or underexplored uh, country in terms of uh, you know what, what people talk about when they talk about geopolitics. Um, so we're, let's do a deep dive on Japan. And, and maybe we can start with what is the right sort of mental model to think about Japan and its role? Let's say, let's say over the last century, though, you can go back further if you want, because it seems like you know it, it was an enemy of the U.S., then, then turned client state of, of the U.S., or that's what some people say, then, then uh, you know, has, has become more independent o- over time and is going to be uh, you know, a pretty significant player in sort of uh, how, how Asia uh, evolves as the U.S. Uh, retreats a little bit. So, so why don't you give a brief um, kind of background or overview of how, how you see how, how Japan's situation has evolved, and then we'll get to what is the situation today. Well, Japan used to be considered the up-and-coming superpower and replacement for the United States. In the late 1980s, as the Soviet Union ceased to be a challenge, uh, there was a lot of uh, fiction released, but a lot of also serious books, right? There's, uh, I think, a book called uh, The Coming War, where The Coming War wasn't a war with uh, China, it was with Japan, making the argument that since it exceeded the United States in GDP per capita, which, uh, by the way, was the case in, uh, you know, the early 1990s uh, for a period, uh, China would become a much more economically productive society and also technologically more advanced society than that of the United States. Uh, the fiction of the era, uh, sort of, you know, everything from Blade Runner to, you know, of course, anime films, uh, such as Ghost in a Shell, they were all expecting Japan to have these very, like, very technologically advanced, sprawling megacities, maybe opening up to immigration, maybe not opening up to immigration. Um, but either way, the expectation was that, you know, this country might actually per capita and eventually in absolute terms, become wealthier than the U.S. And again, they'd replicated most of uh, America's uh, advanced electronics manufacturing. They had actually, uh, you know, surpassed the United States. In a way, this vision of a Japan that exceeds and surpasses the United States came to be, it's just that this Japan is much smaller not in geographic terms, but in population terms. Today, Japan remains a country with over 100 million people, but the proportion of young people and working age people is much lower. Now, what are the consequences of a much older population? The dependency ratio shoots up, which means that for every uh, person that is in the workforce uh, that is working, uh, there might be one person or even two people that are supported. Now, they might not be supported directly by the individual. It's not necessarily, you know, a diligent son or daughter taking care of two elderly grandparents. But because of taxation and other transfers, it amounts to that. And very few societies so far uh, have really figured out how to make the economics of elder care work, especially since once you are relatively affluent, you know, the Eskimo solution of uh, pushing the old people out on the ice that doesn't work. I'm sure Canada is experimenting with its, uh, you know, with its uh, medically assisted uh, death program, which of course expands every year in a way that's, you know, completely unprincipled and not what the thing was supposed to be. So I'm being uh, a little droll here. I'm being, I'm being um, skeptical of the Canadians and their Eskimo uh, Eskimo ways, or pardon, Inuit ways. Um, I don't think that's actually going to solve their problem because I think it undermines the social contract in too fundamental a way. People will become much more uh, selfish and or much more libertarian, however you take it, if they believe that universal health care is just putting you, uh, you know, out of your misery 
once you're in your 60s, 70s, or 80s. The core of the social democratic social contract that, you know, Canada has and many European countries have, even if it's not immediately obvious, is that we're kind of all in this together. And it's supposed to be this like mutual aid society. And you can't have, you cannot have an unprincipled exception, excluding the old. Now, ironically, in Japan, actually, this concept of self-sacrifice for the greater good works a bit better. There are many people who uh, came out of retirement to work on the Fukushima plant cleanup. Some of them even saying like pretty dark things about like, oh, you know, I've had a long life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Japan remains an extremely high trust society in a way that's distinct from Canada or from Sweden or from, uh, you know, Germany or any of the other social democratic countries. And I do think it's correct to think of Japan as some sort of social democratic country, right? They do have significant taxation. There's a push for the common good. You know, maybe the welfare transfers aren't as big, uh, but the basic structure is this very, very, in a way, uh, communitarian society, except it has this added view that you are supposed to, you know, self-sacrifice to a significant degree to fulfill your social role. Now, this is no longer the feudal Japan of the samurai, but it is still the Japan of the salaryman, uh, the salaryman that stays with the you know large company for most of their working life, uh, sacrifices you know with long working hours, uh, barely seeing their wife or you know their husband, insofar as women are in the workforce in modern Japan, and. The result is this this life where, in a way, your immediate manager is the most important person in your life. In the United States, while people are work obsessed and work very hard, you know, your manager, in theory, can be replaced by another manager. Uh, you could go work anywhere, or so you tell yourself. And the large companies that still work very well in Japan... Like, you know, the another staple of 1980s fiction was the idea of these very efficient, very technologically advanced uh, Japanese, you know, megacorps, right? Developing, uh, you know, replicants and off-world colonies and all of that stuff that we associate with the future. Um, in a way, those never stopped in Japan. In the United States, there came to be an alternate culture, right? We didn't quite go into the IBM future. Uh, arguably, we're a little bit in the, um, you know, uh, a little bit in the Microsoft future, but these companies, at least when they got started, like Google, Facebook, uh, these were not supposed to be mega corporations, right? These were supposed to be small, nimble companies, uh, changing the world, eventually growing, staying uh, creative, flexible, etc. cetera. Um, but in a way, perhaps the United States had these industrial giants in the 50s, 60s, and so on right? General Motors, General Electric, all of these like, you know, economic bedrocks and foundations. Companies like Toyota today in Japan remain that for Japan. And, you know, while they have adapted and adopted uh, modern technology to a great degree, in a way, you know, the Japanese office today is perhaps still more stuck in the 1990s than we might think. In some ways, it's, you know, um, you know, the, the super apps, are more fashionable there just as they are elsewhere in East Asia, but there are still offices that expect you to fax things in. Um, and that's, you know, that's like a, an interesting example of like, you know, when a country first modernizes, the standard way of doing things stays standard, even if technology pushes forward. So in a way, maybe, you know, the peak of Japanese civilization was circa 1995, before the dependency ratio became crushing before it became clear that the fertility problem was not a short-term blip, but a long-term trend. And ever since then, you know, they have tried to offshore in an interesting way, right? Like major Japanese firms have invested in manufacturing facilities in, in first in Taiwan and China and now in Vietnam because they wish to diversify from a geopolitical rival. Uh, to this day, you know, this uh, South Korean and, and Japanese firms actually, you know, assemble and build many of their components in Vietnam. And uh, this is a result, not just of Japan being richer than Vietnam, but Japan having a constricted supply of labor.
So the labor costs are going up faster than Japan is becoming richer. There is an interesting economics paper, however, that demonstrates that even with all these problems, even with taking some of the same solutions that the United States did with, you know, to preserve profits, to preserve the large companies of offshoring, etc., um, Japan, you know, if you control for the aging of the population, all of the U.S. advantages in productivity gains over Japan vanish from the economic data. So that's very important, right? We love talking about how the U.S. is unique. And it turns out if Japan had stayed young, it would be just as unique as the United States, except in a very different, very Japanese way. Wow. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? <laughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time. Plus, Shopify Magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash moment of zen. Go to shopify.com slash moment of zen now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash moment of zen. And so if we can go back in time 30 years, is there anything Japan could have done to sort of, um, you know, address this underpopulation, particularly among the, among the young, or is there anything they can be doing today? Uh, you know, how, how have they, have they done any, anything in the last 30 years that has made a, a dent in, uh, in, in fertility? Um, and what might you recommend? Well, Japan has made efforts to reduce the labor costs of elder care, and they have made some efforts to become a more child-friendly society. I think what should have been done on a very fundamental level was uh, the equivalent of, you know, you know, here's the thing. If, if Japan was, say, the United States or even France, you could argue that, hey, let us accept main, some amount of mainland Chinese immigration. Let's accept some South Korean immigration. Let's accept immigration from these various sources. And perhaps this will help alleviate this, uh, this speed bump while we slowly adjust upwards, basically the, um, you know, basic things like the childcare subsidy stuff that Sweden does. This would have definitely improved their situation. It wouldn't have solved it. And of course, it would have transformed Japanese society. So I'm saying, I don't think Japan could have done this. You, um, you would have provoked a terrible, um, in some ways, maybe justified political counter reaction to any such program within Japanese society. Uh, I do think that what could have been done is the equivalent of declaring a national emergency and immediately giving sort of huge tax exemptions for the second child. And even making it more importantly, a policy that top executives, you cannot make top executive unless you have more than two children. Like if they made that a careerist requirement in the major Japanese corporations would sound super interventionist, like lock up the upper echelons for those who have children. Um, it's a form of, I'm sure it's a form of, uh, you know, kind of discrimination, et cetera. But I think that would have trickled down. It would have trickled down through the salary man culture. Now it might be almost too late because for people, having children has become this exotic, strange thing. And, uh, you know, we're seeing some of the same trends, of course, in the Western world. But I think there's a, a difficult crux here that no Western country has solved and no East Asian country has solved. 
uh, which is the contradiction between the expected social role of a parent, a father, a mother, uh, and the role of a good employee, a hardworking employee, a dedicated employee, someone that puts in weekends, right? Unless you can have the family person pr be promoted, um, upward mobility comes at the cost of fertility, and people will always choose upward mobility over fertility. And the problem then is if everyone chooses upward mobility over fertility, the whole country experiences downward mobility. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a big problem, like in the international rankings, right? Yeah, that's a fascinating idea. Maybe it could work in the West too. Uh, sort of, you know, uh, make a cultural movement, if not a, a legal, uh, you know, one to uh, encourage executives to have have two kids and uh, and shame the ones who don't. <laughs> I mean, there at least should be a removal of stigma of having uh, lots of children, and I think that is partially driven by uh, the the misaimed environmentalist view that, you know, fewer people, fewer environmental problems, right? I think that's, that's not correct because often when you go for fewer people in an already industrialized society, the result is less efficient ways of doing things and more polluting ways of doing things, uh, as we discussed on some of our previous episodes. But to go back on the big picture of Japan, you know, the Japanese situation is not hopeless. There might be a significant cultural revolution and rebound eventually. Um, I do think that for Japan to be Japan, uh, it does require a fairly high population. So it's not the case that Japan's population could say shrink to 50 million people or 60 million people, which is it, it is set to over the next hundred years, and it stays economically Japan. It will become rapidly very impoverished. And people might say, well, is, is that a problem in itself if it becomes relatively impoverished, right? If it becomes relatively impoverished and, and goes from being a first world country to, you know, maybe having a GDP per capita comparable to, you know, I don't know, modern day Portugal or something like that, or modern day, uh, modern day uh, Poland. Uh, the problem is that if you have an already old society that experiences a decrease in wealth, the emigratory pressures for the young become very severe. It's sort of like, you know, you're fighting against economic headwinds, right? There's no tailwind pushing you forward. Uh, and you find yourself completely, uh, you know, swimming against the current. And you might as well move to the United States. You might as well move uh, to Canada. You might as well move to Australia, maybe even move to China, right? That's still an economically rising country. Um I think that there might be something like a tailspin effect, which we're starting to see in some of the poorer Eastern European countries. The wealthier ones are, you know, in a way succeeding, but the poorest ones, such as Ukraine and Romania, have their few young people move abroad because they can and because it's much richer, uh, the world's much richer, and the economic growth is much better. Um, there's the opposite of this, of course, which is Poland, Estonia, and these places that are experiencing rapid enough growth and are sometimes at this point benefiting from, um, you know, people coming over from Ukraine as refugees or economic migrants or people coming from Romania as economic migrants or Bulgaria. Japan can still adjust, especially if the automation bets that the whole world is making work out. They have pushed automation in this classical sense very, very far in Japanese manufacturing. And they have been doing this and pushing in this direction intentionally as a matter of government policy since the 1980s, right? What was it? The effort for the fifth generation computer, for example, and uh, various robotics initiatives. Um, these have shown middling results where the use of Capital to substitute for labor is sort of the basis of the industrial revolution. And they certainly do not have very expensive energy in Japan because of a well-developed fleet of nuclear reactors. However, it seems that automation is most productive when paired with a large labor force. And you just need the scale of tens of millions of people working in, the, in, a, in an in an indus, industrial sector for there to be benefits to an agglomeration effect such as we 
observe in the, you know, uh, in the broader Shenzhen area in Guangdong province in China and also other provinces in China. It becomes very useful to deploy automation when you have a highly diversified, specialized economy at scale. Um, you know, building a machine to do a job that only one company needs to do is always very expensive. Building machine for a job that, uh, at least even if it's still one company, uh, is needed in a hundred factories or a thousand factories becomes much cheaper, let alone if it's done by many, many companies across the world, right? So in a way, automation is something that we do in society to basically allow the, the vast majority of workers to move on to a frontier area where we don't yet have enough workers for it to be worth to automate things. So I think thinking of automation and scale as almost synonymous is a good description of what automation has been for the last 200 years. It's not that you make a single smart machine to do everything that a human can do. You make a single dumb, pretty energy expensive machine that however is cheaper than the labor that does what, you know, a thousand humans could do or 10,000 humans could do, right? Uh, or, or at least a dozen. You, you know, I think it's, it's hard to get even the economics to have, to buy a machine that replaces a single worker to work, right? Uh, what's the yearly salary of a worker? Um, you know, if it's like a, you know, European style country it might be 30, $40,000, something like that. Well, okay. How much maintenance and care and labor does this machine that you bought to replace this factory worker cost? It might be 5,000 euros a year. It might be 10,000 euros a year. Uh, it's certainly not going to be, uh, quite a steal, that kind of steal, unless you replace many, many workers, right? You mentioned that Japan can't remain Japan, you know, and go down to 50 million people or something like that, as some people predict. But do you not, uh, can you not imagine a world where the sort of automation or robotics or sort of the AI and tech gets so good that we can actually substitute a large amount of human labor with, uh, with, with technology and thus Japan will be, uh, will be okay? I mean, Japan is shockingly okay. It's certainly, it, it's certainly dealing with a different set of problems than Western countries that, um, say directly embraced immigration. Um, but it's doing actually fine. It's per capita, you know, GDP has not yet gone down. It's almost this red queen race where they're pushing ahead in these investments in automation and everything else. And they're sort of barely keeping up with this, uh, demographic, demographic tailwind. I think that, look, even in a world of very good automation, you still want to have more people up until the moment you have automated everything, right? And the moment, if it happens, when you out automate everything or when you outcompete humans and everything through truly generally intelligent, cheaply manufactured machines, right? Machines that can be adaptable and can be put into any part, any new part of the economy that a human can be put in, right? When we get to the point where machines do things that can't scale, right? Um, at that point, you know, yes, you are perhaps okay. Perhaps you have been a leader in automation. Um, but Japan sure has been waiting for this for a long time, for 40 years. And, you know, uh, I, I think that there is an important way in which they have to, they have to solve the fertility issue to some degree. They have to solve it, um, in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years or this country, you know, they would still speak Japanese, but they would be significantly impoverished. Right. And the young people would flee. And then I don't think there's, an easy or good solution once that tailspin starts. For now, no one's leaving Japan in great numbers, but I think that could very easily happen since this red queen race is becoming ever more intense. Now, there are substitutes they could pursue, right? They could say, they could choose to lean into cheap energy to a great degree. I'm you know, not really sure if they could compete in international nuclear exports immediately, um, but if there were new, cheap and abundant energy sources, uh, that I think 
almost does more than advances in artificial intelligence. Now, let me explain why. It also does feed into artificial general intelligence in, into various kinds of uh, other kinds of artificial intelligence, um, mostly due to the GPUs uh, being an energy intense thing to manufacture and then, you know, modestly consumptive thing to run in great quantities. Um, it is the case that the energy, energy just is required to move stuff around, basically. So everything, basically everything we do can to some substitute, we could do more of it if energy is cheaper, right? So that can help keep the dependency ratio going and the intelligence systems could help increase the dependency ratio. But the case still is that even if Japan is saved by these economically, right? These technologies are available to the whole planet, right? China might be saved by it too, but uh, there'll always be countries such as Turkey and India that might grab these same technologies yet also have cheaper labor. So of course they might outcompete Japan in key manufacturing sectors. So no, there are two things we're talking about. There's the like absolute, couldn't much older society actually sustain itself uh, through the use of advanced technology? Answer is probably yes, at least if it doesn't get worse, if the TFR doesn't drop even lower than 1.3, uh, maybe down to like 0 0.7 is what South Korea has. At that point, you have to actually expect the singularity within the next 20 years uh, for that to work out. Um, but in an international competitive sense, it's not an absolute sense. Uh, there will be a country somewhere around the world that is just as good at using automation as you are and has young, well-educated labor that's not being taxed incredibly to support the old. So like, how are you, how is your company, how's Toyota going to outcompete them? Right. Why hasn't Japan embraced mass scale immigration to help? So, and, and if they did or do, what, what would the effects have been or, or be? I think they could have embraced a system similar to the sort of Canadian point system. I think the jury is out as to whether countries other than the United States can make mass immigration economically successful. Maybe you only want to be the richest country in the world with open borders, and you don't want to be the second or third or fourth or 10th richest country in the world with open borders, right? Um, I mean, you know, truly open borders is a different thing, but uh, the case is that the U.S. sort of takes the cream of the crop of the world's talent. And then, you know, maybe Canada's number two. Where on this list would Japan be in terms of top talent? To some extent, sure. Uh, they would attract some people. Like Japanese culture has a deep charisma in the West. There are people who uh, like it, love it, appreciate it. Um, but... I don't, I don't think it's clear that say immigration will work out even for Germany, right? Maybe not even France and France is much better at assimilating immigrants than, than Germany. It seems that the scale required to make it work is so much greater and already at this limited scale, that's not even solving the pension system in Germany and in France. They've sort of run out of economically productive immigrants, like straightforwardly, if you run the numbers, the social services that are used by uh, immigrants in, in Germany and France on net almost outweigh the economic benefits. Now, eventually this calculus can change either through cutting social services or, uh, you know, hopefully the second generation then ends up being, uh, you know, more highly, more highly skilled, more highly educated. Uh, you know, they're not, say, escaping war-torn Syria anymore. There may be, maybe they've gone to a good university. Maybe they've, uh, you know, created a new and interesting, interesting company. Uh, it's, it's not clear. It's not clear Japan could have competed in that. Singapore, I think, is trying and succeeding very hard at competing, at attracting top talent. But it also has a system that in the West we would find distasteful where there are people with, uh, you know, basically like temporary, actually temporary migrant labor where uh, people get to work in Singapore, but they're not tracked on citizenship or anything like that. 
it's similar though less extreme to uh, the system that the Persian Gulf countries use, where the vast majority of the population in the country, living in the country, uh, do not have citizenship and do not have a right to stay beyond their term and are basically just working for the minority of people who are citizens, right, who receive sort of the oil dividends. Um, so I feel like, I feel, it feels to me that Japan could have done significantly more in this domain, like especially in the 90s and especially in the early 2000s, uh, they could have been in a better place today. Um, and the political and social problems would have likely been minor, but they would face a very similar problem. Uh, they couldn't have done it at a massive enough scale without introducing like this massive culture war uh, domestically, right? And honestly, at that point, Japan wouldn't be Japan anymore either right if, if half of the population were chinese is that still that's that's no longer japan really so you can't fault them for not choosing that if they feel themselves culturally distinct uh but i think they could have easily been japan could have stayed japan and just been 80 uh 80 japanese i think that would have worked out fine <laughs> yeah w w what is the right way of thinking about how homogenous japan is and, and it's like 97 percent the... plus <laughs> <laughs> it's like ludicrously homogenous. I mean, it's it's definitely it's it's a it's an ethno state. There are not many of those in the world, but they they are one. <laughs> and how does that affect the culture? Relative, like, if Japan was seventy percent Japanese versus ninety seven percent, like, at, at what point do you start to see material impacts in, in the culture? And and how do we differentiate the ethno states from the like what what makes them so distinct? Besides the fact that they're you know ninety seven percent or mostly one people, like wh where else do we see that impacting the the, the country well here's a um, you know a, 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 you know we, we almost inevitably are now making this accidentally a meditation on on nationalism right this is not necessarily the direction where we want to go talking about japan uh, however it is unavoidable i think japanese japan is a very nationalist society um the view is that the state is the embodiment of this common community that our people has and historically speaking at least in europe the less libertarian European countries uh, tended to be nationalist. Like 1930s, Sweden Social Democrats were Swedish nationalists. They were talking about the creation of, you know, a, a, a national a national home, right? Like a place to take care of everyone in our community, where the idea was that there's this deep uh, sense of feeling kinship history and there are ways in which civic, civic nationalism can replicate some of these basically like honestly pre-rational, deep emotional commitments. Uh, these motivate action both with very talented people, but also motivate just generally people, um, you know, everyday people uh, to, uh, to do th things better, to do things for each other, uh, to accept taxation, to accept conscription, to accept all of these other things. So I think civic nationalism can replicate 70 to 80. Again, something like America is also a surprisingly nationalist country on most measures, except it's not quite a single nation. It claims to be, but it's, it's deeply conflicted about what it means to be a nation. And there's constant culture war waged over that. But let's say civic nationalism with the right ideology can sort of replicate a lot of these social technology, social technology aspects of being homogenous. Um, of course, now even that might start breaking down in some Western countries, arguably like in France, the big debate is, are we still going to do civic nationalism and the belief in the Republic and making everyone learn the French language, regardless of, you know, what their religion is or where, where their parents are from or grandparents are from, or are we going to embrace like this plurality of ideas, this, um, multi multicultural approach where maybe honestly different legal standards apply for different people, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of this, you know, I, I, I don't want to call it, you know, woke. You don't want to use those terms. You don't want to politicize things. Um, but the view in the 2010s was, Hey, assimilation failed. Let's try to, let's try to do, let's try to make several parallel societies just work together in the same polity. And that's, that's a challenge European countries haven't solved. Uh, but for Japan and, you know, other countries that are, that are like this, you know, 
I do think that there is a significant social trust benefit. There's a way in which, you know, the old people going to clean up Fukushima or whatever, they sort of feel they're doing this for their extended, very, very extended family, right? That's kind of the vibe, right? And, you know, the China has some aspects of this, though it has more national diversity where, you know, people sometimes describe China as an ethno state, but it's not quite true. There's like a lot of difference even between uh, Han, if they speak different languages like Cantonese versus Mandarin. So China, I think, is like almost a, I think it's a two thirds of the way towards Japan, but it has some elements of the American civic nationalism solution for trying to produce a high trust society. And again, you know, it, th there are all sorts of questions that stop being awkward. In Japan, crime is not a racial, uh, racialized question and crime, uh, crime uh, fighting, right? Like, uh, or policing is not such a question. Why? Because there's no, there's no, there might be class discrimination, but there's no idea of like, okay, there's, there's racial discrimination or something like that. That doesn't come up. And in a, in a way, maybe they then accept policing that is too harsh or unfair, but it doesn't feel like it's oppressing a minority or something like this, right? Is the benefit of homogeneity that there's a uh, much less culture war, much more unity, easier to rally around is, is some drawback that maybe there's less dynamism or is that cope? And there's actually not really a drawback. <laughs> Well, you know, I think Japan was very dynamic in a uniquely Japanese way in the 1980s, and it is much less dynamic today. You know, people like to discuss the, um, you know, you know, the iPhone is certainly an amazing breakthrough. The iPod was a breakthrough. But, you know, the Walkman was a pretty cool breakthrough, too. Like, it's 1990s era tech. Uh, the Japanese were often very innovative in consumer electronics. We didn't narrativize them as innovative, but they were. And uh, we all adopted their consumption patterns in many ways. Um, I think that even a homogenous society can be very creative if it is tolerant of, or rather if it does one of two things, if it highly encourages excellence, and the other one is it's tolerant of individual eccentricity. And let's put it this way, I think the Japanese always excelled at encouraging and rewarding excellence, high skill, doing something remarkable, achieving mastery in something. Uh, let's say 1900s Britain was perhaps better at tolerating eccentricity, right? Or 1800s Britain was probably better at this than 1900s Britain, to be honest. So you can have a very innovative, but relatively uh, culturally homogenous country. Um, so I think in some ways, yes, it's cope. Uh, in other ways, if you have a diverse country, you can profit off of the creativity of the world, and bring in anyone and everyone, right? You can bring the Marconis and you can bring the technicians and, you know, you can bring whoever you wish, right? Whatever expert from any part of the world, they can become your expert and it'll be fairly easy for them to, 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 you know, put down roots and live and contribute in your society. Um, and also again, you could be a very diverse country and not be very creative. I'm again looking at Canada, right? I'm looking at Canada. Canada is a very diverse country. It is not very technologically or economically or even culturally creative. It could be, but it's not. So I think that uh, it is possible to do both, right? You can imagine a situation where, you know, severe ethnic tension actually gets in the way of doing things in some very poor, very diverse countries. You have this immense problem, right? Like the former Yugoslavia broke up. Uh, due to these problems, Nigeria and Ethiopia struggle to govern themselves. Uh, because of uh, the conflicts. And this gets in the way of political stability. It gets in the way of rule of law. It gets in the way of fighting corruption, because if you try to fight corruption in Ethiopia or Nigeria, it's, it's always the case that one tribe is going to think that you're secretly purging them from all positions of power, even if you just were going to ar arrest everyone who was a corrupt politician or something like that. Everything gets viewed through a tribal lens. Uh, so... I think that youth is perhaps even more important than diversity in terms of creativity. So the United States is, I think, a very creative Western country, partially because it's one of the younger Western countries. And yes, 
This is partially due to immigration working, but it's also partially due to, until very recently, its fertility having been higher. And young people, you know, they tend to need space to do things in a society that has transitioned from a bottom-up to a top-down heavy uh, sort of age pyramid, the corporate hierarchy also becomes very heavy from the top downwards. The social hierarchy, the academic hierarchy, the governmental hierarchy. Uh, it becomes impossible to be the senior anything. You have to be the junior everything. And the result of this then is that people waste their most creative, productive, energetic years there. And again, that's sort of maybe part of the reason for the U.S.'s continued actual creativity lead has been this idea that you can be very young and can just start and create your own company instead of working up uh, your way in someone else's company. And tech, in a way, greatly enabled this from the 1990s to at least until uh, the late 2010s. We'll see how the 2020s shake out. Yeah, it is interesting in, in Japan how there's this sort of juxtaposition of sort of this careerism or scleroticism or, you know, strong hierarchy, rigidness, rigidity, as you're talking about, but also, and maybe the exhaust of that is this kind of weird cultural uh, sort of perversity or, or creativity in, in, you know, things like video games or things like sex robots or, or sort of, uh, I don't know, incel culture. I, I don't know if that's actually true. I mean, that's, that's also now true of the United States, right? Maybe Japan was just ahead of the curve. It was the society of the future. And the society of the future, we don't leave our room and we play video games all day. <laughs> Speaking of the U.S. and Japan, why don't you talk a little bit about that relationship and how that relationship has, uh, has evolved and what, what that looks like today. And then we'll get to where Japan sits in Asia. Right. Um, Japan uh, was definitely a, one of the most successful countries in the world in terms of development and modernization, even long before uh, the successes in recent decades, right? The Meiji Restoration basically resulted in a massive political and economic change where Japan very quickly caught up to some of the leading powers of the Western world militarily, uh, first defeating Russia, and then over time, uh, you know, coming to contest Britain and the United States, culminating in sort of the Second World War. Uh, there was in between, of course, also a long period where the Japanese were close allies of the British uh, because they were considered a naval uh, balance and a military balance to Russian expansion in East Asia. Interestingly enough, after the United States defeated uh, Japan in World War II, uh, the United States, note, had uh, put on basically an oil embargo um on Japan, they had uh, stopped exporting various key natural resources to Japan when Japan invaded China. Uh, eventually, the Japanese were sort of convinced that they only had uh, this very limited window within, within which they could win uh, the war in China. And there was a unrealistic view that if you wiped out uh, enough of the American naval fleet, it would just be possible to retain naval supremacy for long enough to push terms onto the U.S. and allow Japanese expansion in Southeast Asia and other places where it could acquire a resource base, a natural resource base to match its growing industrial base. So in a way, Japan was pushing outward because it industrialized and required na natural resources that were, you know, um, independent of the geopolitical whims of foreign powers to sustain and grow that industrial base. And that drove them into this uh, form of Japanese imperialism. This clashed with US ambitions in the Pacific Ocean because the United States had already in the 30s identified, honestly, even the 1920s, had identified the Pacific as a key area of future interests, right? Theodore Roosevelt was instrumental in uh, working out the arrangement in China after the intervention of European powers. You know, the Philippines were basically a U.S. colony. Hawaii, you know, had not yet been made a state, was just a territory. Now, after uh, the war was over, Japan's industrial base, in a way, was allowed to redevelop for similar reasons to that of Western West Germany. Um, someone put it, the, the worry was that these countries, if they are deindustrialized, become impoverished, might become breeding grounds for communist revolution. Like if the US, a capitalist occupying country is making us poor, perhaps we should be a communist country instead. And there was, you know, a communist party movement 
in Japan after World War II. As this industrial base redevelops, in a way, Japan got its, uh, you know, co-prosperity sphere, which is what the name was for the extended Japanese empire and its puppet states. Uh, but it wasn't Japanese. It was America's co-prosperity sphere, right? America guaranteeing global ocean trade, America guaranteeing Japan, uh, you know, fair trading terms for natural resources underneath, uh, you know, with other American client states. And ultimately, while the U.S. did forbid Japan from arming itself militarily, from uh, developing, from developing uh, significant, uh, that's not quite true. The, while the United States prevented Japan from openly remilitarizing, openly redevelop, you know, redeploying its navy, its air force, its army, uh, and definitely preventing it from intervening anywhere, uh, the U.S. was a final guarantor of Japan's security, first versus the USSR, and secondly, now evermore, versus China. So the United States and Japan went from being political rivals for the Pacific to, okay, America owns the Pacific de facto, but Japan gets to thrive economically and now are in a position where the U.S. sees Japan as a as a useful counterbalance to China, and Japan views the U.S. as necessary for it to remain politically independent with, of China, even as it does far more business with China than it ever did before. There was uh, also a period where economic competition from Japan was considered excessive, and this led to a by now forgotten trade war where the U.S. attempted several protectionist measures that were arguably somewhat successful uh, to not be outcompeted uh, completely uh, by uh, the Japanese corporate world. Say more about uh, the sort of the state of the military um, today. You, you did a, a deep dive on it in Bismarck Brief that people should 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 check out. And, um, you know, what does Japan's military situation mean for for you know, where it situates itself and and um, in sort of the geopolitical you know game here? Well, Japan uh, had imposed on itself and to a great extent has accepted a pacifist constitution since 1945. Next year will be, you know, 2024 will be the first year since 1945 that Japan will have an operating aircraft carrier. So how can you have a pacifist constitution with a self-defense aircraft carrier? Um, this is very interesting, right? Um, the the solution to this is essentially that they nominally were not immediately allowed to rearm in the 1940s and 50s. But by the 50s, especially the Korean War um, that the U.S. was involved in, that China was involved in, that the USSR was involved in, uh, changed everything. And the belief was very quickly that in practice, we should allow Japan to rearm. Does this mean that the Constitution is toothless? No. It does mean that, for example... Uh, Japan cannot enter certain kinds of military treaties, and Japan cannot justify easily intervention abroad. Japan has invested in one of the world's best navies, even if it's, you know, uh, not notionally, it's supposed to be closer to a uh, coastal, to a coast guard than a proper navy, but it is one of the world's best navies. Um, their air force buys and uses the same equipment that the U.S. Air Force uses. You can have these wonderful, uh, you know, pictures of Shinto priests uh, blessing the uh, F-22 or the F-35 or whatever. Uh, it's kind of surreal seeing like American, what we consider American hardware, right? The jet, uh, the jet fighter uh, sort of completely, uh, you know, uh, completely uh, ass assimilated into that cultural practice and completely owned by Japan. Um, Japan has a space agency, uh, actually a very high quality civilian space agency, but this also means it has all the technical expertise needed for uh, ICBMs, for intercontinental ballistic missiles. When it puts, uh, you know, a UAE uh, probe, when it puts a UAE uh, lander on the surface of Mars or an orbiter or whatever mission, uh, another country hires them to carry out, you know, if you can put a, a probe in the orbit of Mars, you can certainly put a nuclear warhead in Beijing and, you know, maybe even further afield, maybe even Moscow. Uh, 
that capacity is there. There's just some assembly required. It also has a large stockpile of plutonium. Again, there's a civilian uh, energy program, which I think is very good for Japan. But in practice, this means that they are known to be, by all major powers, one year away from developing nuclear weapons. So you have a space program and a civilian、uh, research program. Plutonium, by the way, is not necessary to generate electricity. But you know, you're stockpiling it for a reactor that you've not even built, a special experimental reactor. When really, it's like, okay, that is your reserve so that you can build hundreds of nuclear warheads if you need to within a year, if the geopolitical situation changes. So there is a nuclear arsenal in Japan, some assembly required. Their navy is a significant factor in any potential future fight over Taiwan. So that's why it really does matter whether Japan has a navy and why the US, the US might have not wanted Japan to have a navy in 1930. They certainly want Japan to have a navy today. Why? Because no matter how strong the Japanese navy, they're never going to dominate the Pacific. It's only a question does the US with Japan dominate the Pacific or does China on its own dominate the Pacific, right? So the US is now in favor of that type of naval, naval buildup. Finally, also, Um, the perspective on the Japanese military, though, of the general population might be an example where the pacifist constitution has become real. The population in general is not in favor of significant military engagement. It is not clear they would be happy with significant military casualties. Now, under the certain conditions, I'm sure the Japanese people, again, this is perhaps a benefit of nationalism, would be willing to fight for Japan, like if there was a literal invasion of Japan by China. But even,、uh, but a more ambiguous situation where US and, and Chinese ships start shooting at each other around Taiwan, there's perhaps not even an invasion of Taiwan yet. It's not clear how many casualties、uh, the Japanese public would, would want to endure, especially since, again, in young societies, it's a tragedy of history, but in young societies, young men's lives are cheap. In old societies, I think we are starting to see that young men's lives are dear. They are expensive.、Uh, Ukraine's and maybe even Russia's demographic damage. Uh, the economic damage caused by people dying on the battlefield and not being replaced by other workers because you're not, you're not having enough babies, that might yet prove to be crushing, right? Like the hundreds of thousands of dead in Ukraine today. And this is keenly felt on a basic social level. It's,、um, we,、uh, you know, anyone who's a parent know you love all your children and you certainly, you know, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be. And it's not the case that you would feel the tragedy of your only child dying more keenly. However, however, in practice, I think people work much, much harder to stop their only son or only daughter from dying in a war. Than they do if they, you know, if they have 10 children. Maybe they care all about all of their children equally, but they have to disperse their efforts of, at draft dodging and bribing to 10 kids. So it's, you can't do it for all of them. Maybe you can do it for,、uh, for three, but you can definitely do it for one. Even if you're a middle class family, you can probably find a way to smuggle your, your son or daughter out of the country, right? And again, in war, mostly we still conscript men, though I'm going to note if dr- the drone warfare revolution continues, Then truly there'll be no argument not to also conscript women. And that might result in a very interesting culture war of its own kind、uh, for 21st century society. Wow. Yeah, that would be interesting to see.、Um, maybe gearing towards closing here,、um, maybe, maybe as a last big question to take on is like, say more about how you expect、uh, Japan's role in Asia. To, to play out as sort of the, the chessboard changes a, a bit? What are the sort of things you're, you're watching out for, or what are the, the things you predict,、uh, w- besides what we've discussed so far, might,、uh, might play out as a vis a vis China or, or elsewhere within,、uh, within Asia?、Mm-hmm. Well, one of the most important things is that there's no economically prosperous future in the aftermath of a, of a hypothetical war with China.
because Japan already is significantly invested in China, right? Like there are just factories that are owned by uh, Japanese companies. There are business partnerships that have become integral. Just as the U.S. cannot, you know, you know, cannot reshore everything home or even French or that is, you know, put it on into allied countries uh, in the same way Japan can't really do that anymore. Now, having said that, Japan is determined to be politically independent from China. It is determined to not follow Chinese policy. On a very fundamental level, they disagree with the Chinese approach to society. Um, and they they will basically, for nationalist reasons, continue to oppose China. So even if economically it was better for Japan to enter into a Chinese economic arrangement, right? Because China, at the end of the day, doesn't put that much ideological pressure on its client states. It's very few client states. But precisely because Japan is homogenous, because Japan is a very weird country, because it has a nationalist uh, identity, I think the view of political independence being paramount is going to be top of mind. So my prediction would be Japan will, if the U.S. remains in Asia, continue to be a staunch U.S. ally. Now, this doesn't mean that they will be a U.S. ally in everything, everywhere else around the world, but they will regionally be a U.S. ally. Um, they will basically not have significant frictions with South Korea, despite the economic competition. That's going to be resolved through whatever protectionist sort of uh, trade war these two countries might engage in, right? But if the U.S. were to withdraw from East Asia, I actually think Japan would continually would continue to stay independent from China, except they would very quickly, you know, assemble that nuclear arsenal I mentioned. Russia demonstrates today that with a sufficiently large nuclear arsenal, even if all other indicators of power are unfavorable, there remains a hard limit beyond which a more powerful country uh, can't necessarily stop you from doing what you want to do or cannot actually uh, affect regime change, uh, no matter how hard the other stuff is. So I think Japan, were the United States to decide that actually we lost the struggle for East Asia, it's now China's backyard, we're no longer, you know, the great power in the Pacific, we share the Pacific. In that situation, I think we would see a nuclear armed uh, Japan. And I think that would be mostly fine, except it would uh, definitely put pressure on China to increase the size of its nuclear arsenal. So that might have negative effects because then that is a race that the United States might feel compelled to re-enter. And uh, that is perhaps a more unstable world. That might be a good place to wrap, but uh, but I just wanted to ask, um, is there anything we didn't get to uh, that you uh, about Japan that you think is particularly important to, to leave uh, listeners with as a another thing to keep in mind as, as we think about the country? I think Japan is a, a great exemplar of a country where the short-term economic future of having people work very, very hard and sacrifice everything in their life and dedicate everything in their life and rejoice in their life through uh, their work, I think Japan shows the limits of that. And I think these are limits that we will encounter in the Western world as well. As well, maybe this is top of mind because it's uh, Christmas, but to me, it you know, or at least was yesterday. Um, but to me, it seems that we have to reintegrate family life, uh, the obligations and responsibilities of a citizen, and work into something more coherent and uh, sustainable than what we have currently. That's a great place to to to, to wrap uh, this this holiday episode. Uh, Samo, thanks so much for for coming to the podcast. And until next time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Live Players. Please subscribe, leave a review, and check out Samo's excellent newsletter, The Bismarck Brief, for more rigorous analysis of key individuals, institutions, or industries. Live Players is a production of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Econ 102 with Noah Smith and Moment of Zen.